It is Sunday, May 10th, 2020, and I am Pastor Mark Dilley of West Valley Grace Fellowship. I pray the message this morning will be used to strengthen you in your faith and encourage you in your walk with our Savior and Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. In the last few lessons, we've been talking about spiritual life. We've been talking about salvation and justification by faith. And today I'd like to sort of summarize it all up and point out this fact that salvation is much more than just the forgiveness of sins. But the forgiveness of sins is the primary issue in the message of salvation for today. Our salvation is through the cross of Christ alone. Adam's sin brought unimaginable devastation to both physical and spiritual death, along with a depraved nature which has alienated the human race from God. Let's look at a couple of verses, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 21. Colossians 21 and verse 21. Colossians 1, 21. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. And so that was the condition that Adam's sin brought to every human being. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2. In verses 11 and 12, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Now we've, in our Wednesday studies, we're talking about rightly dividing the word of truth. And it is critical to understand the difference between a Jew and a Gentile the difference to understand between God's dealings with Israel and God's dealings with the church, the body of Christ. And so here in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 11, God, uh, Paul is pointing out the horrific condition the Gentiles were in. And so in verse 11 of Ephesians chapter 2, Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, that done in the body by the hands of men. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. And so we Gentiles were in a horrific condition before the revelation of God concerning the gospel of his grace. The salvation that God has provided in grace for us today removes every obstacle that prevents fallen man from having a relationship with the one holy righteous God, the creator of all. Let's look at these verses. Romans chapter 5 beginning with verse 10. Romans chapter 5 and verse 10. 
For if, when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we can also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Now there's a word that we just touched on about four times in that passage, the word reconciliation or reconcile. And it means to change thoroughly or completely change the nature of something. And that's referring to the position that man was in, alienated from God, enemies of God. Uh, that position came from being in Adam. But now God has reconciled the world. He has reconciled that position through the death of his son on that cross. That now God can be just and the justifier of the ungodly because he has reconciled man's position before him. And that's what happens when you put your faith in Jesus Christ. God reconciles you. He changes everything. All that you were in Adam has been done away with. And you now are a new creation, a new creature in Christ. But let's look at another verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 16. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And beginning with verse 16. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Now that's a very important verse. What the Apostle Paul is declaring here is that even though everything we have comes to us through Jesus Christ, we don't recognize him as the Christ that walked on the earth. We recognize him as the Christ who was crucified for our sins, buried and rose again the third day, and then 40 days later ascended into heaven and is now seated at the right hand of God. That's how we know Christ. And so then Paul goes on here and says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, and now here's where the Bible trying to help, I think, confuses the issue. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature or a new creation. Now, that is true, but that's not what I believe this verse is pointing out. I believe this per verse is saying that if anyone is in Christ, a new creation, there is no he is in the manuscripts. The translators, not truly understanding right division, added those words in an effort to clarify things. And in the process, I believe they have really clouded things. I believe Paul is saying that if anyone is in Christ, a new creation, the old has gone, the new has come. In other words, the old that was all that we were in Adam has been done away with. And the new, which is the new man, the body of Christ, all things are made new. And that is such a marvelous truth to understand that in Adam, everything I ever endeavored to please God with, as long as I was in Adam, it had no value whatsoever for God. But now in Christ, it's all been made new. And being in Christ, I can serve God. And so what a blessing that is. But let's go on with this. All this is from God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ 
and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And here is what that ministry amounts to. Verse 19, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. There's another marvelous verse found only in the gospel of the grace of God. God is not counting men's sins against them today because he has been propitiated or satisfied with the death of his son. His righteousness, his holy demands have been fully met through the sacrifice of his sinless son. And so now God can be just and forgive sinners their sins solely by faith in Jesus Christ alone. And then let's go on. And he has committed to us, those of us that understand the gospel of the grace of God, the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so the concept of reconciliation is that the whole human race was under the curse of sin. And now, through the sacrifice of Christ, God has reconciled that situation and made it possible for anyone to be reconciled to him personally by faith in Jesus Christ, believing he died for our sins on that cross. And that's what it is to be saved. This salvation is in Jesus Christ alone. There is no one else that can provide that salvation. And it is given exclusively to those who have truly recognized their need for deliverance from their sin and to trust in the sinless Son of God who died for those sins. And so having heard and believed the gospel of salvation, we now have been brought near, having been alienated and enemies of God. All of those who have trusted Christ as their Savior have been personally reconciled by God to him. Now, God never has to be reconciled. He never has to be changed in any way. But that doesn't mean that he hasn't changed the way he has dealt with the human race. And under this marvelous gospel of the grace of God, he is freely bestowing eternal life to anyone who will simply believe that Christ died for their sins. And so let's look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. We just read Ephesians chapter 11 or I mean chapter 2 and verse 11, and so this is what follows that. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 13. We were separate from God, separate from Christ, without God in the world and without any hope. And then he goes on to say here, verse 13, but now... In Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. And so this theme is continually the message of salvation in the gospel of the grace of God. It is always by grace. It is always in the person of Jesus Christ. And it's always on the basis of his death on that cross where he bore our sins in his body. Okay, let's go. Uh, having believed 
the gospel, we've been made alive with Christ. Ephesians chapter 2. Again, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. Our salvation is in the person of Jesus Christ alone. I'm amazed today. It's, it's a pretty much acceptable to everyone to talk about God in some way. But as soon as you start to mention the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and the only way to heaven, you have become politically incorrect. But yet, I would much rather be a servant of God and please God rather than men. There is no salvation in any other than the Lord Jesus Christ. There are not many different religious ways to God. Jesus Christ himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father but by me. And so I stand uncompromisingly on the gospel of salvation found in Paul's letters, found in Christ alone. So having been saved by grace through Christ, through faith, we have received the forgiveness of our sins. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 13, and here comes another little aspect of this marvelous pure gospel of grace that so many people truly haven't understood. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 13. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins and so every sin that I have ever committed every sin I will ever commit God has already forgiven me that is the gospel of the grace of God Jesus Christ bore my sin in his body on that cross and he died in my place so that I could receive the forgiveness of my sins. Now, I realize there are many people that believe that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, that it was right there that God forgave the entire world of all their sins. But I don't believe that would stand the test of Scripture. Uh, I'm not going to go into it right now, but I'll just make some references to it. For example, when Peter preached, he told them, Repent and be baptized, and you shall receive the remission of your sins. And Paul mentions the same thing. I'm not going to spend any more time on that thought right now, but I believe totally that the forgiveness of sins comes when you put your faith in Jesus Christ who died for those sins. And so... Let's look at a couple other verses real quickly. Let's look at Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And in the King James Version, 
it says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. It reads more, the King James reads more like Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7. Let's go back there. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Do you see that continual pattern? It's always about grace, it's always about Christ, and it's always about his sacrifice through his blood or through the cross. And that's why I believe Paul said in writing to the Corinthians that the preaching of the cross is what he focused on. And the preaching of the cross is foolishness to the world, to most people, to the unsaved, until they are illumined to this marvelous truth. It is foolishness to them. They just won't believe it. Okay? Having been justified by God, we have the righteousness of God imputed to us. Now, we've studied these things out before, but I want to bring them all together before we move on into sanctification. And so, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30. It is because of him, God, that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. And then Paul adds to that, Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. In other words, in regards to our salvation, we heard in Ephesians, it's a gift from God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Here Paul is saying, if we are going to boast, boast in this marvelous gospel and in the person of Jesus Christ who died for our sins. And then, having believed this gospel and that all of these truths are part of this marvelous gospel of the grace of God. Can I lose this? Can I do something that would separate me from God now that I've been united to God? And I believe understanding the gospel, the grace of God, brings you to this understanding that nothing in all the world can ever separate me from the love of Christ or from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 1. Now somebody might think, boy, you just use one part of the Bible over and over again. Yes, that's true. Because the gospel of the grace of God is written in Paul's letters. He was the one chosen by Christ commanded by God, ordained of God, to take a message to the Gentiles. And me being a Gentile, he is to take it to the Gentiles, to their kings, and the children of Israel. This gospel for today, the gospel of the grace of God, is for the whole human race. And it is a very exclusive, distinct message of pure grace. It doesn't depend upon us. It depends upon the faithfulness of God and the revelation of his grace to us in Christ Jesus. And so let's look at Ephesians chapter 1 and beginning with verse 13. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth. And that's what you're hearing today. The gospel of your salvation. Having believed, and that's the key, having trusted in that gospel, having trusted in the person of Jesus Christ, having believed, you were marked 
in him, in Christ, with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. And so in the gospel, the grace of God, all who have believed in Jesus Christ, that he died for their sins, God seals you, which is your guarantee. It is the Spirit of God himself who indwells every believer. He is that seal, and it guarantees your redemption. There is no way that that can be undone. And the implications that theoretically, if it could be undone, it is just amazing all the things that God would have to edit or retract or change and we'd go out of Christ and back into Adam and we would be dead in trespasses and sins again and then we go down someplace and get saved again and then we lose it again and it becomes just ludicrous to continue in that type of cycle. In the gospel of the grace of God, salvation is all of God's grace, freely bestowed on every individual who trusts in Jesus Christ. And so let's go on here again. Let's go to Ephesians 4.30. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. Paul writes, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, which, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. God has sealed you. He is the one that nobody can take out of his hand. Nothing can ever separate you from his love that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And having believed the gospel... And here comes this amazing truth. Having believed the gospel, we have been baptized by the Spirit of God into the body of Christ. This is another facet of this marvelous gospel of grace for us today. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. In verse 13, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, in verse 13. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. This is a critical truth to understand and embrace. That when you trusted Jesus Christ who died for your sins, God, through his spirit, baptized you into the body of Christ. Your existence before God today is in Christ. In Adam you were dead in trespasses and sins. In Christ you are alive unto God. All your sins have been forgiven. God has declared you righteous in his sight. All the marvelous implications of believing the gospel have been given to you. And so like it says in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, well, let's turn there. We're not far from there. I think that's important that we read it from the word. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning with verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing already. In Christ. And that's where we are today. In Christ. 
And so this baptism into the body of Christ unites us with him so that we believers have been identified with him in all that he has accomplished. And there is no water involved in this baptism. In this baptism, it is by the Spirit of God placing us into the body of Christ. Let's look at Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 in verses 3 through 8. Romans chapter 6 beginning with verse 3. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? Now I want to stop there and point something out. It's by grace that we are saved. When a believer today puts his faith in Christ, he is spiritually taken back to the cross. And he dies there with Christ. He is crucified with Christ. He is buried with Christ. And he is raised up to walk in newness of life in Christ. And again, there is no water involved with this baptism. There's no water being involved. Water couldn't do what this baptism does. Let's go through that again. Verse 3, chapter 6, verse 3. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We died with him. Verse 4, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death. In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. And then verse 5, if. And that's not a conditional if. It is the idea of since. Since we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self, and that's our old man, that's all that we were in Adam before we were saved, all of that, as he goes on here, was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with that we should no longer be slaves to sin but anyone who has died has been freed from sin and then paul goes on now since we died with christ we believe that we will also live with him and so this great salvation that we have by the grace of God in the Lord Jesus Christ is a completed and irreversible transaction which is sealed by God and secured in Christ who has become our life. We need to clearly understand that our salvation is totally the work of God and it is guaranteed for all eternity. We need to understand that our salvation was freely bestowed by grace through faith without any cause within us. This is the marvelous gospel of the grace of God and the glorious gospel of salvation which the ascended, exalted, and glorified Lord Jesus Christ revealed to the Apostle Paul. This message of pure grace was never heard anyplace else until it was made known to Paul. I mentioned a couple messages back or a while back. How many times does the word grace appear in the Gospels? And I think it's four times. It doesn't appear in Matthew. It doesn't appear in Mark. It appears once in Luke and the other times in John. But in Paul's writings, it appears over 40 times different references to grace. That is because Paul 
was the revelator through Christ to make this marvelous gospel known. How many times did the earthly Christ mention grace? Not once. That's what makes this message for us today such a glorious gospel. When we have the full assurance and understanding of this distinct message entrusted to Paul, it brings a tremendous joy and peace to our lives. When we truly understand every believer, when we truly understand this message, every believer is overwhelmed with praise and thanksgiving. <clears throat> Our life is to be focused on this marvelous gospel of his grace. And we are to set our affections on things above and not on the things of this earth. For example, the present situation with social distancing and isolation and quarantines, none of that has any impact whatsoever on this marvelous gospel and the peace and joy it brings to our lives. And so let's conclude with what Paul instructs us to do if we understand how marvelously we have been blessed in the gospel of the grace of God. Let's go to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Rejoice, Philippians chapter 4, beginning with verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent, or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me, now that's Paul talking, put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. What Paul is saying here, when you understand the riches of God's grace for us today, it will bring you this marvelous peace. And so he says, what you have seen and heard and received from me in his letters, think on those things. That is the sound doctrine for today. And the God of peace will be with you. And then one more, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Begin with verse 16. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. That's what God wants from every believer. To be joyful always. To pray in every circumstance. To give thanks. And so in our present situation, in whatever situation you're in, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, all of these earthly things one day will be past. And you will be with God forever because of his amazing grace and this great salvation that he provided for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when we truly understand this, it sets us free from legalism. 
It sets us free from the concept of, if I do this, then God will do this. That's not the arrangement in grace. The arrangement in grace is God says, I have done it all for you. I am faithful, I am able, and I will do it. Our submission to that is faith, believing and trusting God to fulfill his perfect purpose in our lives. And so we walk by faith, not by sight. And we trust him. We submit ourselves, presenting ourselves to him as living sacrifices. And we trust him to do what he says he will do. And so in the end, the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 14, 8, he says, if we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. I pray that this message has been an encouragement to you and that you have grown in your understanding of grace. Again, I want to just make this announcement. If you uh, want to call me, if you have questions or concerns or anything, Call me anytime, day or night, at this number, or email me here. And if you would like to get the notes, let me know, and I will put you in contact so that you can have the notes for every message. Okay, have a great day.